And the key is he lets us go through difficult times now to learn to trust him now. So that when that time comes, we learn to trust him. Because as I've often said, if we never had opportunity to learn to trust him, we would never learn to trust him. And that's what life's all about as a Christian. So we want to go through this lesson today and see just what this is all about. And we go to question one. It says, in order to identify the mark, we must first identify the beast. In prophecy, what does a beast represent? Well, let's go to this Daniel 7.23. We looked at Daniel 7 in the past, and it's a little reminder of what beasts represent. 723. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom which shall, upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break the pieces. So we notice here that, that beasts represent kingdoms. And we looked at those four sometime in the past. Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, and then the little horn that came up as a papal power. So the beasts represent kingdoms, uh, powers on earth. So now we're going to go into Revelation. And according to Revelation 13, 1, this beast with the mark comes out of the sea. What does water represent in the prophecy? Well, let's look at these two verses. Revelation 13, 1. Revelation 13 is the chapter that deals with the beast and the mark of the beast. Notice 13, 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, upon his horns ten crowns, upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So here's that beast that we're warned against, and it does come up out of the sea. Now let's notice in um, Revelation 17, 15, we're letting the Bible define its own terms here. What does water represent? And he said unto me, the waters which you saw where the horse heads are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So when this beast comes up out of the water, it's coming up out of a populated area, uh, like Europe, which it came up out of. Um, and we're going to see in this prophecy, there's another beast that comes up out of the earth, which in contrast would be a rather unpopulated area at the time. So this beast comes up out of a populated area, and as we'll see, it comes up out of the area of Europe. Now as we go to question 3, read Revelation 13, 1 to 8, and verse 18. Notice that this beast, which has a mark that I must not receive, has eight pronounced characteristics. We'll be looking at exhibit one. We've listed these eight points and identified the power they describe and for us to study it. So let's first of all look at the text here in Revelation chapter 13. Going back to that. And we want to take verses one through eight. We already verse, saw read verse one, the beast of men are the sea. Verse two, and the beast which I saw was like a leopard, had the feet like the feet of a bear, mouth like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, seat, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is likely to the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given to him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, the blasphemous name, his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given to him to make war with the saints, to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And we also want to read verse 18. 
Here's wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, and six. Okay, with these verses, we're going to learn some things about uh, this power. So we're going to look at Exhibit 1. I recommend you pull that out right now, a little blue paper. Uh, and it will say at the top right, Exhibit 1. So let's notice. It would receive its power. See? And authority. Now, if you notice that, it said here um, in verse 2, the last part, the dragon gave him his power, seat, and authority. Now, the dragon, we actually saw this last time. The dragon ought to be a Satan, right? But Satan always works through earthly powers. And remember in chapter 12, the chapter just before 13, here, when Christ was born, it said a dragon stood before the woman that, to devour the child as soon as it's born. Well, it wasn't Satan himself there, but it was Satan working through the Roman Empire to destroy Christ. And, and he worked through Herod, who was the Roman governor of that area. So when we're looking at this time period, the, the earthly um, representative, if you want to use that word, of the dragon that Satan was using was the Roman Empire. And so what we find here, the, the dragon of the Roman Empire gave the beast its power, seat, and authority. Well, we've looked at that in the past, you might remember. Uh, remember at first it was illegal to be a Christian, then Constantine the Great became a Christian, and then everybody wanted to be a Christian, and when that happened, the church became corrupt. And those who are high up in the church, they have a lot of power and authority. And when that happens, corruption comes in, egos come in, wanting more power and authority. And so you had centers of Christianity, Alexandria, uh, Antioch, Rome, Jerusalem. And so these bishops who were ahead of the church in these areas started vying for power. Who's going to be the most powerful individual in the church? Well, the, the the Roman Emperor Justinian, now this is all history, we've looked at this before. The Roman Emperor Justinian said, I'm going to solve it. The bishop in Rome, he's supreme. And that decree went in in 533. Now, everybody didn't agree with that. Three nations fought Uruli, Vandals, Ostrogoths. I may remember those three names. Anybody? Okay, good. Good. Yeah, those three nations fought it. And they were overthrown. And, and then that was the little horn, you know, and Daniel's son came up, overthrew three, and by 538, the Bishop of Rome was supreme. And that's exactly what it says here. That this power would receive its, uh, the, the, its power and authority from the Roman Empire. And that's exactly what took place. And from then on, you, you see the papal power becoming stronger and stronger and stronger. And then you get on into the Dark Ages, which we've looked at. More and more false teachings came in, as some have said, baptized paganism. Came into the church. And um, those who didn't want to go along with that, were the one who followed the Word of God, they persecuted. We're going to see that here. So that's what that's talking about. Now, it would become a worldwide power. It would not just remain in Rome. This power, the papal power, would become a worldwide power. And that certainly took place. Now we notice something else about it. He would rule, <coughs> excuse me, for 42 months. Do you remember that from our other studies? We saw that in Daniel chapter 7. We saw that in Revelation chapter 12. And how, how many days is 42 months? 1,260 days. Yeah, because it's multiplied by 30. 1,260 days or 1,260 years. That's how long he would, would rule. Now, you remember, as I just said, 
he was in full authority by 538 A.D. because of just didn't. From 538 on, he got stronger and stronger and stronger, became a persecuting power, went into the Dark Ages. And then, what year did end the 1260 years? You remember? 1798. So in 1798, something should have happened to the Pope. Well, it did. <laughs> there was this great upheaval in France, the French Revolution. We even studied that in, in Revelation 11. There was the French Revolution. There was a reaction against God and against the Bible. And Napoleon knew that the Pope had been a powerful influence in Europe for, for centuries. And so Napoleon said, I can't have that. I'm going to be the ruler in Europe. So he sent his general Berthier to take that Pope prisoner. And that Pope died in exile. And it happened exactly when God said it would happen in 1798. Now, as we go on to about this power we read, it would be guilty of blasphemy. Blasphemy. Now, we looked at that in the past. Um, we, can, we can look at it again here. John 10, 33. We'll review for us. Let the Bible define what blasphemy is. And by the way, what I'm sharing here, this is not a prophecy against Roman Catholic people. There are many very sincere people in the Roman Catholic Church. They love the Lord, they follow the Lord to the best of their knowledge. That's very important to know. And remember also, there's a text in James where, where God says, Therefore, for him to do good, and who does it not, to him it's sin. See, God only holds us accountable for what we know. And, and so there's many folks um, in the Roman Catholic Church that don't know these things. And so God's looking at the heart. And, but in due time, this morning, we'll go to the entire world. And then everyone will have a chance to decide. So we notice here is a blasphemy power. Let's go to John 10, 33. And then notice Jesus here being accused of blasphemy. And the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work be still me not, but for blasphemy. And because you being a man, make yourself God. So one definition of blasphemy is claiming to be God. Another definition of blasphemy is in Luke 5.21. Let's go back to the gospel. To your left. Luke 5.21. And the scribes and Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaks blasphemies? Who could forgive sins but God alone? Well, Jesus could forgive sins. He's God. You and I can't. You know, I can't you know, pronounce upon you if you're forgiven. Uh, only God can do that. And when you look at the, the Roman Catholic power, and you've got some quotes here we looked at before, um, claiming to forgive sin. Turn your page there. It said, this comes from Catechism. It says, question, does the priest truly forgive sins? Or does he only declare that they are remitted? Answer, the priest does really and truly forgive the sins in virtue of the power given him by Jesus Christ. That's the blasphemy. And then claiming to be God. And you've got in small print where these quotes come from. Thou art another God on earth. The Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself, hidden under a veil of flesh. So it fits the definition of blasphemy. What we're doing here, we're kind of putting together many pieces of the puzzle. If you just took one piece of the puzzle, well, you might come up with a lot of different ideas who the peace power is. But when you put all these different pieces of the puzzle together, then it will become very clear who the beast power is. And this is another piece of the puzzle. Now, let's go on down to the, the next part. He, he would receive a deadly wound, which would be healed. Then the entire world would follow him. Well, when did he receive the wound? The year? 1798. Many concluded, by the way, after that, the papal power and authority was over. But the 
Bible didn't say that. The Bible said the womb would be healed. And sure enough, uh, it took a while, started coming back, and on February 11, 1929, Mussolini, who was, of course, the dictator in Italy at the time, Mussolini signed the Vatican back over to the Pope. And so now, and in fact, I don't have any newspapers from them, but I've seen some headlines. Some headlines actually said about healing of the wound in so many years uh, when that decree was signed by Mussolini that the Pope, again, was back there in authority in the Vatican. So the Bible directly indicated that's what would take place. And you, I ask you today, is the papal power a world power? Yes. Certainly is. Certainly is. You know, I'll give you one other verse that's not in here, but it, it fits with all these descriptions. Uh, let's go over here to 2 Thessalonians. Paul foresaw this power as well. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together to him, the coming of Jesus, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letters from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. He says, No. Go, man, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, what day? The coming of Jesus, the second coming. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Now remember, we saw in Revelation the second message that's being given to the world right before Jesus comes. Babylon is fallen. Fallen from truth. Here Paul is predicting that would happen. He said before Jesus comes back, he said, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, then notice the next verse, who opposes and exalt himself of all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And that fits exactly what we just described. Taking the providence of God, that's what blasphemy is. And the temple of God in the New Testament is the church. So right here, Paul tells us that this last day, son of perdition, would actually be in, in the church. <laughs> and, and he would be exalted himself above God. And what we've been seeing in several other lessons as well as today's lesson, that's exactly what took place. And he would also have a mystic number. Boy, has not been done with this. 666. Six, six. I'm sure everybody's going to 666. Six, six. It, it was a custom in John's day, a man could go by a number. They would take the letter, you know, Roman numerals, 5 is 1, I is, I mean, 5 is V, and I is 1, and C is 100, and so forth. Um, they, would, they would add up the letters of a man's name and get a number. Now, you could come up with a number. I'm sure there's a lot of individuals through history that their letters could add up to 666. If this was the only piece of evidence we have, well, it may not be, be real meaningful. But if you put this piece of evidence with all the other evidence, okay, now it's making sense. And notice you've got in your lesson there the official title, one of the titles of the Pope, Vicar, or Vicar of the Son of God, Latin, Vicarius Philippia. You see that? On page two. And when you add it up, 112, 53, 501, 666. Amazing. It's all there. And uh, it, it's there if one wants to study it out. So it's, it becomes quite clear uh, who this is. And it would also be a religious power in its involvement in worship. So he would seek to lead others 
to worship him. Um, and worship is who you obey. Um, like for instance, God, Jesus said, you cannot serve God and mammon. You know, mammon's money. A lot of people in this world, their God is money. They'll light, cheat, steal, whatever for money. That actually is their God. That's who they're serving. They're, they're giving up every principle for money. Well, we find here then that this power will seek worship. And how does that work then? Well, as we've, we've seen from before, who we obey is who we worship. And, and if we're obeying the word of God, we're obeying God, we're worshiping God. If we're obeying the dictates of man, then we're worshiping man. It's a very simple equation. And that's what we have seen and we will see again in this lesson today. It says also, he would uh, make war um, and persecute the saints. And we have certainly seen that, persecuting the saints. Now, let's get this together here. Let's go on as we move on here. The beast mark of the Lord. We see who the beast is. Now let's see what his mark of authority is. Number four. Since we have now hotly identified the beast as a papacy, let's permit the papacy to tell us what its mark is. Now what I want you to do, you look at exhibit two. Two. And this comes from the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine. The question is, if you see that at the top of that, uh, it says, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. And then if you go down to the next paragraph from James Cardinal Gibbons of Baltimore, he said, to quote the last part of that paragraph, of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was correct. And the act is a mark for ecclesiastic power and authority in religious matters. And you've got some other quotes down there. So, one thing, like, remember I told you the story when I was in college and I found out that the day of worship was changed from Saturday to Sunday. I had to prove it to myself and I went to the library. And sure enough, there it was. And then since I saw that the Pope had changed it, I, I wanted to find out why. And so my friend in college and I were roommates, um, I said, hey Tom, let's call up the Catholic priest here in Fort Collins, Colorado, and see what he says. So he said, sure. Um, since Tom had a Catholic background, I felt a little secure to come with me. So we went, very nice young priest, and I asked him, I, I said, uh, if, you know, did the Catholic Church change the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday? And he was honest. He said, yes. And that's one thing I could hand it to the Roman Catholic Church. They're not hiding it. <laughs> You know the ones that have the trouble with it? Protestant churches. Because they'll try everything to show that, oh, wait, there, here, it's in the Bible. They can't find it. Because it came from the Catholic Church. If you look at history, so the Catholic Church is honest in that sense. And the reason they can be honest in that sense, they believe they had the authority to change it. And so he said, yeah. And I said, why? He said, two reasons. One, the Jews. And the Christians kept the same day. Well, that makes sense. Both had the Ten Commandments. Both had the Fourth Commandment. Both were keeping the Seventh Day Sabbath. And he said, but the Christians wanted to make a distinction between themselves and the Jews. So they moved toward Sunday as their day. For a while, both were kept, if you look historically. And then it moved on over to Sunday. And then he said, and there's a second reason Christ was resurrected on Sunday, so we keep it in honor of the resurrection. So he was honest in what he told me. 
But again, he couldn't give me any biblical reason. It was all on church authority. And, and, and that is true. So when we look at this, this here, the mark of authority, what is the mark of authority that the Catholic Church chain, uh, claims? It's authority to change God's law. And, and so that, that, they have no problem with that. But uh, it's certainly not difficult. Now, the Bible actually predicted this. You remember we looked at Daniel 25. We took two lessons ago. Seven, I'm sorry, Daniel 7, 25. Um, we looked at this little horn power. And, and we looked at this verse. Daniel 7, 25. He shall speak great words against the most high. That's the blasphemy. Shall wear out the saints on the most high. That's the persecution. Think to change times and laws. There's a change in God's law. Changing the Ten Commandments. We find here that they omitted the second. Uh, bound down the images. They divided the ten. They got two in covenant in order to get ten. And then they changed the fourth. From the seventh day to the first day. That's what he says. Predicted. They would think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand in the time, time, and dividing in time, and there's that 1260 year period again. So, as you look here, filling in the blank, it seems incredible that the papacy has been able to change the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday and have virtually the entire world follow. Did the papacy really change God's fourth commandment? Sabbath to Sunday, or only think they changed it? Well, it says they would think the change. Times and laws. As far as God is concerned, they didn't. They didn't change it. They thought they did. What was God's criticism of his ancient priests, number six, um, or pastors? Malachi 2. Malachi 2. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you are departed out of the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. There have for I have also made you contemptible and base before all people, according to you, have not kept my ways, but have been partial in my law. That's pretty uh, strong language in it. And so it says, you cost me to stumble at the law. They've been partial in the law. Knowingly giving God partial obedience is no obedience. Remember that text in James? If you keep a whole law and yet offend in one point, the only law. Partial obedience, I tend to look at it as convenient obedience. I will obey God where it's convenient. <laughs> but where it's not convenient, I won't worry about it. That's, that's what they were doing here. Now, let's notice here in, in Hosea, you've got. Number seven, how did the people in Hosea's day regard things of God's law? Hosea 12, 8, 12. Hosea 8, 12. He says here, I have written to him the great things of my law. But they are counted as a strange thing. I find that text very fascinating. How many times, and maybe you've experienced it now too, when you share with a friend, a Christian friend, that Saturday is the seventh day Sabbath, according to the law of God, it sounds like a strange thing. I'm 
I'm sure you went across that too. That's exactly what was happening. Is that Sunday is so etched into the tradition of Christianity that when you come along with the idea of Saturday, it's so true. It's saying, oh, that's strange. That sounds strange. How can that be? It's only strange because the falsehood was taught. But once you know the truth and you start entering that, it's not so strange. And to be honest with you, to me, Sunday is strange because that didn't come from God. That, that came from man. Now, number eight, God said that religious leaders in Ezekiel's day were profaning holy things, putting no difference between profane and holy things and showing no difference between the clean and the unclean. And notice here, what, what specifically did he have in mind? Well, as you read that, it says, they have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths. So Satan has attacked the Sabbath, not only in New Testament times, in Old Testament times as well, because he hates the Sabbath. It's a memorial of not only God creating, but of God saving his people. So they were hiding their eyes from God's Sabbath. Now as we go to question nine, what did God say about the tents to change his law or his word in any way? Well, he said, do not add or diminish a single thing. God said it the way he wanted to say it. He, he put his law out there the way he wanted it. Don't add to or diminish it. He also said, if you add to his word, he, I was saying, he counts me as a liar. In other words, God didn't even want to say it. God is lying. God doesn't lie. Who's the liar? Satan. It says he's a liar from the beginning. And remember, that's his one weapon, is the lie, but he's good at it. If he can get you to believe the lie. God's weapon is truth, but Satan's weapon is the lie. And Jesus said, heaven and earth will sooner pass away than one tittle of the law to fail. I told you about the dots and temples. They were pronunciation marks. Nothing was to change in God's law. Now, popular churches, such an I'm embarrassed, uh, when we asked the papacy, how could you change God's holy law? Uh, if they want to stick to the Bible, I'm embarrassed, but they're not quite so embarrassed because they feel they have the approach, the authority to do it. But Protestants, they have the challenge. And in Exhibit 3, I won't take time to read it, but also when we had the lesson, I forget the number, we had the lesson on the seal of God on the Sabbath. Then we had the lesson that looked at all the Sunday texts. We also had in that lesson an exhibit, which was quote after quote after quote from Protestant churches about the Sabbath. And, and so they're the ones that have the challenge. They'll come up with different reasons to keep Sunday but not any real biblical reasons. So I was exhibit three. How the mark is received. Okay, let's go back to our Revelation 13, verse 16. I will say, most pastors you talk to today in other churches, most of them know Saturdays the Sunday Sabbath. There was a time they weren't as aware of that. But I think today most are aware of that. But then they come up with rationales. Uh, Revelation 13, 16. It says here, And he caused all, both small and great, rich and free, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. So they're receiving the right hand or their forehead. Now, in the Bible, um, it's, it's not an idea of a tattoo, it's, a, it's an idea of what's in your mind. Remember God says, I'm going to write my law in your mind as frontlets, as frontlets between your eyes. By the way, some of the Jewish folks who take the literal, have you ever seen, I think they're called phylacteries, have you ever seen some real Orthodox Jews, they, they wear something around their head, it's a little leather pouch. 
the laws in there rolled up. And so they're wearing the law as frontlets between their eyes. No, it's not talking about a literal thing like that. It's talking about a law in the mind, uh, in the heart. And that's, that's where God wants to put his law. But Satan, he wants to put lawlessness in our mind, disobedience in our mind, or in our hand. Now, how does that work? As we're going to see in this lesson, the day's going to come when Satan is going to enforce lawlessness, enforce sin. Now, some people will actually be deceived and think Sunday is correct. They're deceived in the mind. There's other people that are not, they're not all that religious. But if the law says you got to do it, they do it. That's, that's in the hand. Doing it. And you've got some verses here that, uh, that bring up that, that concept. And so as we move to our next one, this tells us what's going to happen. Do people now, who now observe Sunday as a holy day, have the mark of the beast? Okay? Uh, Revelation 13, verse 16 and 17. And he caused both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark um, in the right hand or in the foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So the day is coming when no one can buy or sell unless they have the mark. So the question is, does anyone have the mark now? No. People that go to church on Sunday, they do not have the mark of the beast today. But when the time comes, and it will come, because prophecy tells us, that there will be laws passed that no one can buy or sell except they go along with Sunday, that's when it will become an issue of the conscience. And that's why God's giving the the warning. Now, I think we can see a little bit how that can come about. The world is not getting better. The world is getting worse. And as it keeps getting worse, there's calls, and there's good calls to say get back to God. I mean, that part is good. But what's going to happen in the end, it's going to get so bad that there will be calls to get back to God. Well, how do you do it? Sunday would be a part of getting back to God. And that, that's, that's why when that happens, people that say, well, I'm for obeying God, but I, I can't go along with Sunday, I'm going on the Sabbath, they'll say, what's the matter with you? And so they're, and if things keep getting worse, you can see how um, it could get quite antagonistic against those who choose to keep it sound. So that's coming. That's still future. So nobody has the mark of the beast today at all. Now, in these last days, God has commanded his angels to hold back the winds and strife from the earth until something happens to his people. What's that something? Well, we've read this text before. He says, hurt not the earth till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. He's waiting for the seal. And what does God want to put in our foreheads? Well, let me give you a text in Hebrews. Hebrews, this is the new covenant promise. We're all living on a new covenant, right? Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8. We're finding fault with them. He said, Behold, the days come. Says the Lord, will now make a new covenant with the house of Israel, the house of Judah. Then notice verse 10. Here's what he's going to do. This is the covenant, the new covenant. I'll make for the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts. I'll be to them a God, they should be to me a people. So what does God want to put in our foreheads? His law. What does Satan want to put in our foreheads? Lawlessness. And the Sabbath, according to prophecy, will be the visible evidence, if you will. The visible evidence, if we're committed to serving God, or not. 
That's going to become the visible and the, 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 the line of demarcation of, of who's choosing to be on God's side and who's choosing and have been deceived on the other side. Now, as we go to question 14, who will receive God's wrath in the last days? Well, that tells us those who receive the mark of the beast. And that's what we're going to study next time, by the way. Tomorrow is the wrath of God, which is the seven last plagues. Now we go to test the loyalty. How does God decide who it is we serve? Well, let's go to Romans 6.16 and notice what that says. Romans 6.16. Know you not that the whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. So that's a pretty straight talk. We're servants of whom we obey. If God says, remember the Ten Commandments, Romans 77, we seek to obey him, then we're servants. Sorry about that. Uh, we are a servant whom we obey. So if if we know the fourth commandment says remember the Sabbath day, then we shall obey that. And we'll obey God. If we know the seventh day is the Sabbath, but we choose Sunday anyway, then we're actually obeying man. It's between obeying God or obeying man. Now number 16, how does God count me if I am neutral? Uh, this is an interesting text of Christ said, He that is not with me is against me. So in the end, there's no one on the fence. You're either with the Lord or not. Um, that's why they can get the mark in the hand, by the way, of the beast. You notice God's seal is not in the hand. In the head. That means belief. But the mark of the beast can also be in the hand. And what that says, there can be those who aren't religious at all. They could care less about Sabbath or Sunday, even about God. But if the law says you can't buy or sell, you're going to have a hard time surviving, well, I think I'll go along with it. See, that's the mark in the hand, where the mark in the forehead is only with, with, with God. According to Revelation 13 and 11, John saw another beast rise up out of the earth about the time that the beast in verse 1 went to captivity. Who does this represent? Let's go ahead and read that. 13, let's go back over there. Revelation 13. And we want to notice here verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like horns of a lamb that spoke as a dragon. Now, remember, the first beast came out of the sea, which represents people, right? Populated earth. And it continued for 1260, and when did the 1260 end? 1798. So as that power came up out of the sea, Europe, populated area, and ended in 1798, now there's a power that's to arise, coming up out of the earth as contrasted to the sea, which would be the new world, back then there wouldn't have been here, and it would come up somewhere around 1798, because that's when the other power lost its power. Well, when you look historically to that, the United States came up at that time. And when you think about prophecy, there are so many nations prophesied in the Bible, you would think the United States would be prophesied in the Bible, and it is. And this is the prophecy that gets into it. And, and so it talks about the, the United States here, and the, the rising just about that time. And it says here, a lamb, it was um, coming up, two horns like a lamb, uh, kind of like a lamb-like 
like beast to start with, but then changes, then speaks like a dragon. We were originally founded on Christian principles, religious freedom. That's why people came to the United States. They wanted freedom to worship, to say to worship. But Satan doesn't want you to have religious freedom. So this nation will change, as we're seeing this prophecy, from religious freedom to enforcing, speak like a dragon, Sunday. And by ourselves, I'll show the mark of the beast. So right here, you're seeing this power rise. You're seeing the kind of power it would initially be, but then the kind of power it will become. And so what two tragic things does the second beast cause people to do? We've got here 13, verse 12, and verse 16. It says here, to worship the first beast and receive the mark in the hand on the forehead. So, the United States will play a role in bringing in Sunday. Because remember, worshiping the first beast, Sunday came from the first beast. And so the time will come where the United States will play a role in enforcing the decree of the first beast. And what it will be, it will be Protestantism in this part of the world. In Europe, it's Roman Catholicism. But in this part of the world. And you know what's kind of fascinating? I don't know if you've heard the news, but there's kind of a statement said, the healing is taking place between Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. And there's not so much of a difference anymore. Have you heard that in the news? It is there. It's out there in the news. And so that's what's happening. There's coming in now kind of a unity. The reformers will turn over in their graves because Catholic Church hasn't changed. But this is what, what's coming in slowly. So there will be Protestantism in, in this country. So as we go to question 19, how will the second beast convince people that they should listen to him? This is question 19. It says, he deceives them by the means of those miracles which he had power to do. So there will be deceptive powers going on. And as we go to question 20, to whom will this second beast make an image? Let's go and look at that in verse 13, verse 14. And it deceives them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them which dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. Okay, let's think about the beast. Back during the reign of the beast persecution, it was the unity of church and state. Right? Had to have the power of the state behind it. Church and state carrying out the decrees of the beast. And that's why there's persecution. Now here it says an image is to be made. So what we're seeing here, there's going to be a similar turn of events here. There will be the state in due time enforcing some of the decrees of the church. So actually the religious freedom that we hold so dear will fall by the wayside to a great degree. And what's going to cause that? Things are going to get so bad, and I mean they're going to get bad, that it's going to, in a sense, force people to turn to God and say, God's our only hope. And you hear that some already. God's our only hope to be saved out of this thing. And there's some true preaching along that line. Yes, God's our answer. But what's tricky about it, Sunday will be brought in. If we're going to turn to God, yes, I would agree with them. <laughs> we need to get back to God. We need to have God. But then Sunday will be brought in and it will bring us all together. And if you don't go along with it, you're considered part of the trouble. So instead of saying that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound and did live. Now let's go on to the next uh, God's people loving you obey. Uh, what the disciples say about whether we should obey God or man. That's pretty clear there. <laughs> we have to obey God rather than man. So the real issue is, again, what does God's law say? And what does man's law say? And number 22, what can I do to make certain I will not receive the mark of the beast? Well, 1412, 
keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In other words, the faith of Jesus refers to Jesus' faithfulness. Jesus lives in us most fully through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If he's living in me, let me ask you, does he want to live a life of obedience to the commandments or disobedience to the commandments? What do you think? Obedience, right? That's the life he lived when he walked here. So if I have the faith of Jesus, I have Jesus living in me, and I have his faithful obedience living out of me, then my life will be a life of obedience to the commandments. And that's what Paul described when he said, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But not I. Christ lives in me. And then he said, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, of Jesus. That's what this is, the faith of Jesus. He's saying, I'm living by trusting Jesus to live out his faithful obedience to the Father in and through me. So that's the only way God's people will be faithful in the end. You see, we won't be faithful to, quote, a law, a cold, hard law. No. We'll be faithful to a Jesus who we know loves us and we love him. And he's living in us. And we want to please him and serve him. And we will have learned to yield, yield, yield to him in a confrontation of it and trust him. And we will come to the point that we would rather die than dishonor Jesus. That's the key. And that's why I've told you before, the number one thing you need to know about God, above everything else, is he loves you. Because that's who you'll be willing to. If you're called to, to give your life for is Jesus, who you know loves you, who you love in return. And that will be the reason you'll be wanting to keep the Ten Commandments, including the Fourth Commandment. Because the Fourth Commandment is a memorial of Jesus saving us. And it's an honor of Him. So it's really all connected to loving Jesus and wanting to be faithful to Him. And then God's last morning message goes to the world. And includes, we read this, and this is a review for us. Uh, worship the Creator, avoid receiving the mark of the beast. And number 13, it is now clear to you that a person who receives the mark of the beast is lost. Are they lost because they received the mark? Or are they lost because they're rebellious, refuse to change, accept Jesus' offer? What I would say, I should have probably wrote this little different because they give you a degree. I would say, those who are lost are lost because they didn't learn, learn to let Jesus live out his life in them. That's the real reason. Because when we learn to let Jesus live out his life in us, we won't want to disobey him in anything. That would be the motive. So that would be the reason that they're lost. When you decide to accept Jesus and fully follow him, what happens? Ah, uh, Jesus says, you find rest in your soul. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Until I understood what's called righteous by faith, I didn't understand this text. I used to read it. I wouldn't tell people. But I'd say, um, it's not so easy for me. But once you understand righteous by faith, Jesus lives in you. That's the Holy Spirit. And when you realize, when you're tempted, ask Jesus to give you his victory. Your struggle is over. The only struggle you have is do you want to let him give you the victory? But if you choose to ask him, give me your peace, give me your forgiveness, give me your patience, whatever it is, he'll do it. And that's where it comes in. When he says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, he's the one carrying the burden. And you will find rest. That's the key. Okay, Jesus is waiting at the door of your heart for your answer. That was sheet 20. When you decide to receive the glorious sign as evidence 
but accept him as your blessed Savior, Redeemer. Your own response. Okay, let's go to our, our quiz questions and see what we've got. Um, yes or no? Satan causes many to receive the mark of the beast, and the mark is a sign of loyalty to him. Is the mark of the beast a sign of loyalty to Satan? Yes or no? Number two, the mark of the beast is already placed upon many people. Yes or no? When the law forces a person to buy, stop buying and selling, unless he has the mark of the beast, the beast mark is then received by many. Yes or no? Number four, God's wrath is upon those who receive the mark of the beast. That's our study tomorrow, by the way, God's wrath. Number five, the wrath of the beast is upon those who receive the seal of God in their prayers. Okay? Satan causes men to receive the mark of the beast, and the mark is a sign of loyalty to him. What you got? Yeah. Do we serve God or man? God or Satan? The mark of the beast is already placed on many people. No, no one has it today. But when the laws come in, that's a different story. When the law forces a person to stop buying and selling, unless he has to mark the beast, the beast mark is then received. And that's yes. God's wrath is upon those who receive the mark of the beast. Yes? The beast's wrath is upon those who receive the seal of God. Whose wrath do you want? I don't want God's wrath. And God will protect his people from the wrath of the beast. Okay, here's your response, upper right hand corner there. If you understand what the mark of the beast means now, and say that why God has placed these delicate issues in signs and symbols, or next in box two. Why? You guys are watching. That's good. You are. That's great. Put an X in box one. Number two, if you agree that you have never been more sure and want to be loyal to his word and follow his ways, put an X in box two. Yes, X in box two. If you desire to follow Jesus all the way by joining his last day bringing the church, and receive the seal of the living God by being faithful to his commandments, including the Sabbath commandment, for an X in box three. And that's it. So tomorrow, 1045, right? And the subject is seven plagues of revelation. That's the wrath of God. And uh, we have a fellowship meal tomorrow after the service. And you got refreshments this morning. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the study of the day. Lord, thank you for your word and the prophecies. That this one shows us what's coming in the future. And Lord, I thank you that we have nothing to fear. As we day by day yield our life to you, day by day seek to be filled with your spirit, you promise to write your law in our heart. Help us, Lord, by whatever we go through this day and every day, Help us to learn to trust you in all things. Help us to learn to always choose to follow you in every way that you lead. So that when our Lord comes, we'll be ready to meet him. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming, and see you tomorrow morning at 1045.